Today we're going to take a look at plants. So what we'll do is we'll cover the basics of the plant kingdom and we'll start looking at a particular group within the plant kingdom called the angiosperms. Now we have a lot of experience with angiosperms, especially if you live in North America because if you look out the window, out of your car uh, or your house and you take a walk in the woods, typically what you're going to see the most of are these angiosperms. So they're all around us at any given time when we're outside. They are the type of plant that has flowers. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at their mode of reproduction and why they have these beautiful unique flowers to attract pollinators. So if we break down that group a little bit into three defining characteristics, what we're going to see are three F's related to these angiosperms. The first F is flowers. They are the uh, group of plants that they're flowering plants. Second, they go through what's called double fertilization when they reproduce. And the third F is fruits. So let's go ahead and we'll first start looking at plants, just the basics of the plant kingdom, and then we'll transition into the angiosperms. Basics of plants include two key characteristics. One, plants are multicellular. As you can see this plant growing there, you know that it's more than one cell. It's much bigger in size than a protist. In fact, it's probably made of millions upon millions of cells. Secondly, we know that plants photosynthesize. So, thinking back to the earlier part of your year, photosynthesis has a particular formula. And that formula is going to reflect the inputs to a plant and what the plant is able to do as an output. So the two things that plants need, the reactants for a plant, are water. Your plants aren't going to survive without water. And also carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide you're breathing out right now. Now, through UV light, what we're going to get as a product from that is oxygen that you're breathing in. And we're also going to get sugars. And that sugar may be the sweet type that we think about when we think of sugar, but usually not. Usually it's going to be in the form of some kind of structural carbohydrate that the plant needs to grow big and tall. So we know through biological history that plants came out of the ocean and they eventually uh, inhabited land. So plant evolution is going to be marked by adaptations to a land existence. It had to take on key characteristics that allowed it to survive on land. And a land environment is going to actually offer certain advantages that an aquatic one will not. For example, plentiful light for photosynthesis. If you're a plant and you live underwater, you can only go so far before the light goes away. So there's plentiful light on a terrestrial basis as compared to an aquatic basis. Second, that carbon dioxide, that essential molecule that plants need to survive, it's going to be much present in the atmosphere than it is uh, dissolved in the, flu in the water. So um, plants can take advantage of all the CO2 that we have inside of the atmosphere. So there's some adaptations that are required for a land environment. Let's review for a second what scientific adaptation actually is. So an adaptation is some kind of modification that makes organisms better able to function in their particular environment. And this environment happens to be a terrestrial one, a land-based one. So without all the water around, there's going to be some need to protect all phases of reproduction from drying out. So the male reproductive cell is called the sperm the female reproductive cells called the egg, and then the fertilized embryo are going to be, they're going to have to be protected from drying out. So plants are under this constant threat of what we call in science desiccation, which is drying out. Now, doesn't that make water then a better environment? Well, water does have its, have its characteristics that do make it a decent place for plants to live, but there's many other characteristics on land, the adaptations that plants have gone through that make it more suitable. But let's take a look at aquatic plants just for a minute. If a plant is aquatic, the water environment will provide three things. One, there's plentiful water, so it's very rare that you're going to have an aquatic plant dry out unless it's in a pond that dries out every summer. 
two, support for the body of the plant. There's no need for the plant to expend energy in building a big woody trunk and heavy wooded branches because water is a very supportive substrate and really all, uh, if you've ever tried to pick someone up when they're underwater, very easy to lift, just like the plant's tissues. But if you take them out of water, they're very floppy. There's no strength to them whatsoever because they don't need it. They've evolved to live in that aquatic environment so they can put more of their energy into photosynthesizing and obtaining nutrients versus building supportive structures. And three, if you're already in water, you have a means for gamete dispersal. So you produce the egg, you produce the sperm, and the sperm can just find their way through the watery currents to the female and fertilize there. So um, the means for gamete dispersal is readily available. Some more adaptations that we see in plants is first, and we're talking now terrestrial versus aquatic, the plant body is covered by a waxy cuticle. So on the outside of the green parts of the plant, what we have is a hydrophobic exterior that's going to block water from going in and out. Now there's certain little parts which can allow water and gases to go in and out of the plant. And we learned them previous in the year. Uh, those are called stomata, the little holes that we typically find on the underside of leaves that are protected by two guard cells that are kind of shaped like kidney beans. And those can open and close, allowing for water and uh, gases to go in and out. Um, photosynthesis obviously is going to be utilized, or it's going to be, I guess we could say, helped by those stomata because the, when they open, it's going to allow that carbon dioxide to go in. Um, we also see vascular systems. Vascular systems are systems of tubes most of the time that move around fluids within living things. So, um, for example, in our bodies, we have a vascular system as well that's composed of arteries, veins, arterioles, venules, and capillaries. But Plants don't have those same type things, but if they grow tall, they're still going to need to get nutrients up and down the plant. So what we have is a system of tubes inside of our plant that are going to carry, for example, water from the roots to the tippy tops of the top leaves of that plant. But we're also going to have tubes that carry sugar down as it's being produced by photosynthesis. So then what we have are certain tubes in the vascular system called xylem that carry the water upward. And then we also have tubes that are called phloem that are going to carry sugar downward in the plant to eventually nourish all cells of that plant. Roots and shoots are obviously essential needs for a plant. So the roots are going to dig down into the soil. They're going to extend out and explore the soil, trying to find nutrients to allow it to grow big and strong. And shoots are going to reach up towards the sky and hopefully be able to obtain more UV light than hopefully their neighbor so they won't be uh, shaded out of a good existence throughout their lifetime. Another thing that's going to help them grow upward like that is a molecule within their tissues called lignin. Lignin is a supportive molecule present in the cell walls of plants, and they're going to give it some structural integrity, some rigidity that allows them to reach up real high and stay up high as they're trying to obtain all that so valuable UV light. And the last thing we'll mention is plants have airborne spores that are available for utilization as they try to fertilize one another. So by putting out a whole lot of spores into the atmosphere, possibly one of those spores will land in a good location. And that good location, of course, would be the female portion of a plant, which means then it can be fertilized and a seed can develop. And maybe if it finds a habitable environment, it can go ahead and set up shop there and, and grow and survive. If we take a brief look at the evolutionary history of plants, it's going to have four key moments where plants got better, better suited to the environment that was present on Earth at that time. So up in the corner here, you see what those four are. But so let's take a look at them a little bit down below here on our timeline. And the first big trait that evolved in plants was this. 
the nourishment of the multicellular embryo within the body of a female plant. So before this time, and you can see that plants came from a common green algal ancestor, the ability to nourish the embryo within the female differentiated it from a line of plants called the charophytes, which are still here today, which didn't offer that same protection for the growing embryo. Instead, they live aquatically, and it was kind of uh, one of those things where because you're in water, you can release sperm and eggs, and they find each other due to proximity and water currents and things like that. Whereas once we came out of the water and we uh, came onto terrestrial land, we then needed a way to protect that embryo from the harsh conditions of land, the wind, the sunlight, the drying out aspect. The second big thing that we saw was the advent of vascular tissue. And we talked about that a slide ago. We said that in order to not only bring water up in a plant, but bring the resources down that are produced by photosynthesis, you're going to need vascular tissue. You're going to need tubes going up and tubes going down. And that's also going to allow the plants to gain a little bit in size. So if we look at this group here, the mosses, the hornworts, and the liverworts, these kind of plants, you're, you can find them if you go crawling around in your lawn somewhere and you look for some real short plants, usually a couple centimeters of height is about as high as they can get. And um, by having vascular tissue, that's going to allow plants to grow quite a bit taller than these mosses hornworts and liverworts. And that's when we start to see the lycophytes and the ferns and uh, their allies and the flowering plants and the gymnosperms. So vascular tissue is a big number two. Number three is going to be seeds. So now, not only is there protection, but there is a means to disperse a fertilized zygote and it's going to be inside of a protective case which can sit dormant if times are bad in terms of the environmental cues that are around at this time and wait out until the conditions get a little bit better. More sunlight, more warmth, more moisture. All of those things may aid a seed in germination. So seeds are a really big one and we can see the two types of seed plants that came from that are gymnosperms and flowering plants. The last big trait in the evolutionary history of plants that we see is what we said earlier in angiosperms, the flowers, the double of fertilization, the endosperm, and eventually the formation of a fruit. And one thing we can do real quick is we can also look at the timeline down here as well. 550 million years ago is where we saw the change from the common green ancestor to um, finally having some tor some kind of plant that we're familiar with in the plant kingdom. The charophytes uh, started that off, and then the break from the, into the mosses, hornworts, and liverworts, those plants that went terrestrial. But it wasn't until, and if you track this down here, the divergence of gymnosperms and flowering plants, about 250 million years ago. So we're just finishing up the time of the dinosaurs when these two plants are going to grow more prevalent around Earth. The life cycle of plants is going to involve what we call the alternation of generations. We've mentioned before when we studied genetics what haploid and diploid meant, but now we're going to apply it to plants. So if we take a look at multicellular 1N individuals, 1N means that we are talking about haploids. And when we refer to a haploid plant, it's going to get the name gametophyte. These gametophytes are going to eventually produce multicellular 2N individuals called sporophytes. So a sporophyte is going to be diploid. It has two sets of chromosomes. And the name of the plant will then be a sporophyte and not a gametophyte. So let's go ahead and take a look at this wheel here and the alternation of generations. Let's start with an adult diploid plant. So from a zygote, a fertilized cell, it's going to go through mitosis and, of course, produce millions of cells to eventually become the full plant. And at that point, you have a diploid sporophyte adult. 
That sporophyte adult is going to have structures on them called sporangiums, which are also diploid. But these sporangial cells are going to go through meiosis. And we know what happens in meiosis. Meiosis is going to reduce the number of chromosome sets from 2 to 1, producing haploid. In this case, it's going to be spores. These spores are going to also go through mitosis, and they're going to produce a gametophyte plant in some cases, some cases not, but that gametophyte plant can be multicellular as well, usually a bit smaller, and it's going to go ahead and produce gametes of its own. Now these gametes are eventually going to find one another and fuse in a fertilization event to again produce a diploid cell. And that's what we call the alteration, alternation of generations. If we apply that knowledge of the alternation of generations to the different types of plants that we saw on that timeline, we can take a look and answer the question, which generation is dominant in each one of those plant types? So in the case of the moss, which as we know is a very small plant, you can see that the majority of its life is not in this blue area, but it's actually in this tan area. So the gametophyte stage tends to dominate the moss's lifespan. When it's ready to reproduce, it's going to go ahead and produce a diploid structure, and then it will reduce, uh, produce spores, and those spores will eventually produce haploid plants. As we move up in complexity in plants and closer to today, we then get to the fern group. And the fern group, you kind of see a little bit of almost like half and half. So it can exist as a haploid, and in this case, we see this heart-shaped cell here. We have separate male and female um, reproductive structures here in, um, on the surface of the plant cell. And there's also a time in its lifespan where it needs to form these diploid fronds that you see coming up from the roots, these rhizoid horizontal roots that are um, just under the surface. And you can also see that spores are being released from the underside of these fern leaves as well. As we take one step closer to today on the evolutionary timeline, we see the gymnosperms, and we are very familiar with the conifer types of plants. And we also know that the gymnosperms were seed bearers as well as the angiosperms. So becoming seed bearers is going to allow for the sporophyte to dominate the alternation of generations, the life cycles that we see here. The majority of this is in blue versus just a little bit here that's haploid in this tan area. And even less so when we get to the angiosperms, also seed plants. And you can see just a couple little structures here are haploid, but most of the life cycle will be dominated by the diploid sporophyte. So now we're going to take a look at angiosperms. We said previously to now that angiosperms were our flowering plants. You have a lot of experience with angiosperms because we eat a lot of vegetable matter. So all the grasses, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, herbs, and grains, all of those are flowering, come from flowering plants. In fact, there's about a quarter of a million species around us today of flowering plants. So they're a very successful group. And we saw earlier in the timeline that they started to really develop in the late Cretaceous and early Paleocene periods. The first uh, angiosperm is believed to be what is called Amborella trichopoda, the flower you see here. So through phylogenetic data, we've been able to look and see that this Amborella plant is a sister taxa to all of the other angiosperms that we have today. So kind of somewhere in the recesses of genetic material, we find the same genetic code in Amborella as we see in the earlier forms of all these. So we believe that Amborella was the first angiosperm and all the rest diverged from that a long, long time ago. There are two types of flowering plants. The first plant we simply call a monocot. There's about 65,000 species, and they're called a monocot because they have one cotyledon, or one seed leaf. So if we take a look at some of the attributes of these monocots, this one here is talking about the cotyledon. It has just one present. If you look at a plant and you find that the leaves have parallel veins, that they run lengthwise down the longitudinal axis, you are likely looking at a monocot. Also, um, we see leaves, or, or sorry, flower parts in multiples of three. 
So here is a six petaled flower, and of course six is a multiple of three, so that would be another clue in that you're looking at a monocot. And if you were to take a stem and slice through it and take a look at those vascular bundles, those tubes that bring stuff up and down, you're going to have kind of a scattered type appearance within the stem. Let's contrast that to what we call simply a dicot. Dicots have about 175,000 species around today. They have two nutrient seed containing leaves, which is different than the monocot. And that's where their name comes from, the two seed leaves that we find there. So in this case here, this is probably some kind of bean seed. We have two cotyledons. The leaves of a dicot are typically net-like versus parallel, so we're not going to see those same lines that we saw above in the monocot. Instead, we have a lot more going on here in some form of net-like pattern. The flowering plants, if we take a look at their petals, leaves, uh, sorry, petals of four or five, here we see a five petal flower, and if we were to slice through a stem, Instead of seeing the scattered bundles, we'd see a nice arranged ring that's going to bring uh, water upwards and flow them downwards. We're going to take a look at a generalized flower structure, both the male parts and the female parts, which will eventually provide us the cells that are going to produce a new flower. So let's start with the male parts first. Um, the male parts consist of what we call a stamen. A stamen is actually a two-part structure. The first structure is called the anther, which you can see as these little nodules here at the tips of these almost like tentacle-like structures called filaments. So a stamen then is made from an anther and a filament. Second, we can take a look at the female portion of the flower, which collectively is known as the carpal. And the carpal, as well, has three major parts. The first part is referred to as the ovary. And the ovary, then, is this big, green, almost spherical-like shape at the base of this structure. And the ovary itself is going to contain ovules, which we see in the middle of the ovary. These ovules, if, if fertilized, will eventually develop into seeds. And the seeds are going to pro be protected by what the ovary turns into eventually, which is going to be a fruit. Now, the stigma is going to be this tiny tippy top of the structure here, um, which eventually leads down to the ovary, and it's a sticky little receptor for pollen grains that will eventually travel there. So if a an insect or a plant or, or sorry or an animal eventually brings pollen, that is going to be the place that begins the fertilization process. Lastly, there is a female structure called the style, which is nothing more than a connecting tube from the stigma down to the ovary. Now a couple of other structures that are worth noting are down here at the bottom. Uh, we have the petals, which are collectively known as the corolla. And of course, um, these are going to aid bring certain pollen transfers to the flower. And we also have a receptacle uh, type of structure that has these leaves that are kind of, they're almost petal-like, but they're called sepals, and collectively they're called a calyx, and they sit underneath the flower. This is just a subset of the group angiosperms, and it shows all of the unique and beautiful diversity of flowers, each one evolving to do its own specific thing, each one evolving to survive in the environment that it lives in. Uh, for example, here we have a beaver tail cactus. And of course, this plant, this flowering plant has to be able to survive very harsh, arid conditions. Uh, here we have a water lily, so it lives in an aquatic environment. Um, this one here lives in a swamp-like environment, uh, environment called a uh, blue flag iris. Um, from Michigan, we have some very unique species as well. Some of them are harder to find than others. Uh, for example, this one here, a calla lily, this one's going to live in, in bog-like conditions. Uh, a swampy Michigan native here would be the Michigan native lily. It's his common name. And of course, we have a lot of water lilies here as we have so much fresh water in our state. Flowers can also be characterized on the completeness of their flowers. For example, a complete flower would contain all four flower organs. So it would have the carpels, it would have the stamens, 
it would have petals and it's been cut away, but it would also have sepals. So four flower organs compared to incomplete flowers, which are going to lack one or more flower organs. For example, stamens or carpels. So in this flower here, you can see that it's only the carpel that's present. So this one right here is a female flower. This flower, though, has the stamens present, so that is a male flower, and that would deem them to be incomplete. And also, we can find flowers that are in clusters called inflorences, and these are multiple flowered structures. As you can see here, this one is just lined with flowers from top to bottom, and these have some very unique, diverse structures that I'll show you on this next slide. So the type of inflorences that exist, there are many. Uh, we use them as we try to figure out the species often if we're in a botany type of class and we need to key out a plant. We have to have some details on how that flower structure exists. And as you can see, there's a lot of possibilities. And in fact, I cropped this picture in half because there was this whole second half to it. So um, botany can be a very rewarding yet challenging experience because in most botany classes, not only will you learn the internal and external structures of plants, but you'll also have to identify those plants based on the structural and morphological uh, characteristics that they show. Let's take a closer look at how male reproductive cells are produced within the flower. So as we can see, the key structure for the male parts is called the anther. The anther was the little nodule at the tip of the filament. Now, that anther is composed of what's called a microsporangium, or a pollen sac, and it's made of diploid cells called microsporocytes. These microsporocytes are going to go through meiosis, and as we know, every time a cell goes through meiosis, it goes from one cell to four, so it's going to produce four microspores. These microspores, then, are through development going to turn into what we call a pollen grain. And the microspore will actually go through mitosis and uh, produce a two-celled uh, pollen grain. And what we see here is it's made of a generative cell right here and the nucleus of a tube cell. And then it has a seed coat, a pollen coat on the outside. But as you can see from this picture, it's very spiky, which allows it to stick to that stigma better and the animal that transfers it. But the generative cell that uh, is one of the two cells within it, when it lands on the stigma, is actually going to split into two sperm. So then when it does reach the female flower, essentially you have a, a three-celled pollen grain that's going to allow growth downward into the female part. We'll get to that in a minute, but essentially produce uh, the means to eventually fertilize that egg. So the pollen grain then consists of the two-celled male gametophyte and the spore wall around the outside. We also need to take a look at the female mode of development as we're talking about plant reproduction. And to do that, we have to pay attention to the structure in the center of the flower. We said earlier that collectively was known as a carpal. And the carpal was made of an ovary, the style, and the stigma. So within the ovule, which is inside of the ovary, you are going to see a number of structures. First, the opening to the actual ovule itself is called the micropile. So that's just that little opening at the bottom. There's integuments, which is this brown material here, which will eventually become the seed coat. We have a cell, a diploid cell called a megasporocyte, which we find in the center. And then we have megasporangial cells on the outside. So this megasporocyte here is going to go through meiosis. And when it goes through meiosis, we know that it goes from one cell to four. And there's going to be one winner of those four. And that's going to be what we call the surviving megaspore. The surviving megaspore is then going to go through three mitotic divisions. So those three mitotic divisions will take this original megaspore from one cell to two. 2 to 4, and 4 to 8. And where are those 8 cells? Well, they're right in the center. So let's take a look at them. 3 of the 8 are called antipodal cells, and they're sitting here on the top of the ovule, top of the inside of the ovule. We have 2 polar nuclei in the center, which are haploid, and we have 1 egg 
and it happens to be sandwiched between two synergids, uh, supportive cells on the side that help pollen reach the right place, which is the egg, of course, and the polar nuclei. We'll get to that in a minute. But essentially what we have is we have a megasporocyte going through meiosis to produce a megaspore. That megaspore is going to go through three mitotic divisions to give us these eight cells right here. Three plus two plus one plus two is eight, and that's what we see here. And now we have what's called an embryo sac. So now that we've gone through how a male reproductive plant cell is formed, how a female reproductive plant cell is formed, let's talk about the act of pollination itself. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from anther to stigma. So in pollination events, about 80% are biotic and about 20% are abiotic. So what does that mean? Well, it means that 80% of the pollination events that occur happen from an animal transfer of some kind. Um, insect, mammal, a um, lot of possibilities, but some life form allows for that transfer of pollen. 20% are abiotic means. Abiotic means without life. So what kinds of things can transfer pollen without life? Well, if you think about it, wind can and water can. So the abiotic 20% of pollen transfers will boil down to about 98% of those are going to be wind events, 2% are going to be water events. So let's talk about attributes of flowers that are going to help pollination events to occur. The first is that let's mention that wind pollinated flowers are usually not showy. Now that's interesting. Why not? Well, they don't need to be. If wind is going to disperse pollen and I'm not using an animal to aid me in doing so, then it really doesn't matter if the flower is elaborate or not. Because the pollen that's produced is going to be done in massive amounts, there doesn't need to be energy put into producing a structure that's very showy and beautiful. So temperate trees and grasses are big in producing massive amounts of pollen. And allergy sufferers, I know you're out there, I'm one of them too. They, of course, that's going to affect us in the springtime and the early summer as well. Second, if a mammal or uh, insect does aid in the pollination efforts, then you're going to start to see the flowers become the unique and the beautiful uh, characterized flowers that we know and love. And that's because they're trying to draw those animals and those insects towards them. So what we find is that if a bird pollinates it or an insect pollinates it, the flowers are going to be colorful and often fragrant as well. Fragrances are nothing more than chemicals that are released by a living thing that's going to draw other animals towards it as a means of nutrition. I put a moon up because sometimes these pollination events took take place at night. So night blooming flowers can affect nocturnal mammals or insects. And what we're going to find is that often they are very white or cream colored. And you can see them in the dark and they can also be very aromatic to draw in these animals that do that live nocturnally that do the same job at night. Let's look at the events that occur during a pollination event. The first thing that we're going to see is that a pollen grain is going to be transferred to the stigma. So maybe it was by wind, maybe it was by water, or maybe it was an animal that helped get this pollen grain to the stigma in the right place at the right time. So what's going to happen is that nucleus of the tube cell is going to allow for the sperm to be transferred from the tip of this organ all the way down to the bottom. So the tube, pollen tube is going to elongate all the way. It's headed down this way. It's going to take a turn here. And eventually, we said that it needs to find the micropile. So it needs to come in this direction here. Meanwhile, the two sperm from the generative cell, they're on their way down through the pollen tube. And this can actually happen very, very quickly. Um, I believe that there are rates that have been measured that they can travel up to one centimeter per hour, which is pretty fast for uh, sperm travel in a plant. The second thing that happens after the pollen tube is fully formed, we're then going to see the sperm try to find where they need to go. And that's going to bring in the second F of angiosperms, which is the double fertilization event. There's two things that are going to be fertilized in an angiosperm. One is going to be the egg right here. And the other thing is going to be the polar nuclei right here. So the egg and the polar nuclei get fertilized. And that's why we call it double fertilization. These synergid cells are believed to help the sperm from the pollen grain find the, an usher 
them towards the egg and the polar nuclei. Once the sperm have found their locations, at that point they're going to fertilize those particular cells. And what we're going to get from it are two things. One is a diploid zygote. A minute ago before it was fertilized, both the sperm and the egg were haploid. And we're going to get a triploid, a 3N endosperm. So this cell right here in the center is 3N. Those are the two parts of a double fertilization event. This endosperm will eventually become a food storing organ, a uh, food storing structure that's going to give nutrition to the growing embryo. Once we have successful fertilization of the egg, we then have what's called a zygote. And from the zygote, we're going to see first a transverse division. So a mitotic division is going to go take this one cell here and split it unevenly, producing a terminal cell and a basal cell. Now, each one of these has an eventual outcome. The basal cell will eventually be called what's called a suspensor, which you can see right down here, which essentially is going to attach the growing embryo to the base of, in this case, the base of the seed. And that is also going to be connected, of course, to the receptacle of the flower. Now, the terminal cell, which is found on the top, that's eventually going to become the embryo itself. So the top portion here, you can see it's going through an, a bunch of growth, and you can see there must be mitosis happening because it's changing shape as well. And some of the nutrients from the endosperm are being transferred to that growing embryo because it's going to need nutrition in order to grow. So the triploid endosperm that was produced from a fertilization event of two polar nuclei is going to allow for rapid mitotic growth of the cells that are present in that given area. And what you can see is a sequence of events going from one to two, two to a whole bunch more, probably eight there, and then it just continues on. And what we find is a multinucleate mass on the inside before truly separated cells with membranes and plant cell walls start being formed. So this is actually kind of a semi-liquid type of um, consistency here versus the outside, which is more cellular and more structured than the interior. Meanwhile, we have the embryo growing here at the same time. Um, what is this like in a, in, in a fruit that's being, uh, a fruit or seed that's being made? Well, think of a coconut for a second. A coconut has two parts to it. It has the coconut milk, which is on the inside, which actually comes from this part right here. And then there's the coconut meat, which is the hard solidified uh, structure with the cell walls intact. So sometimes humans will harvest plants that where the uh, seed is in various uh, states of development in order to ingest the products that it provides. So the endosperm development will usually also precede the embryo development. So there's more going on here than the embryo at the current time. In most monocots and some eudicots, Endosperm stores nutrients that can be utilized by the seedling. So some of the nutrients that is around the growing embryo will then be provided to that embryo for growth. In other eudicots, the food reserves of the endosperm are exported to the cotyledons. We mentioned that cotyledon word earlier as we looked at the attributes of dicots versus monocots. So if you look over here, we see a zygote that's going through mitosis. Here's the terminal cell and basal cell. And the embryo is going to continue to grow. It's going to elongate, get a bit taller. And first, it's going to wind up in this round globular stage. Eventually, it's going to reach a heart stage. And then later on, a torpedo stage, where not only do you have the growing embryo, but you now have these cotyledons or seed leaves that are attached to it and they're eventually going to be used as nutrient stores for the growing embryo. If we take a look at this very simple diagram here, we can see what's going on in a number of stages. Here we see the zygote being present in the endosperm nucleus. We see some growth from the zygote here as the endosperm starts to develop. Right now it's kind of a multinucleate mass. 
over time, the endosperm will become more um, structured. The embryo is going to grow bigger and taller as well, taking some of the nourishment from the outside endosperm and transferring it to the cotyledons, which are also growing. The, eventually, the seed coat is going to cause the cotyledons to bend over and actually be folded in half. And meanwhile, the embryo still grows. And then at a certain point, it may reach a stage where it's just going to kind of hold as is until it reaches an environment that allows um, the embryo to break out of the seed coat. Some of the research we do when we study botany and we look at plants is through uh, tagging plant parts with green fluorescent protein, which someone has done here. So here we can see all kinds of different stages that are involved in growth. We mentioned earlier there was a round stage of the growing embryo. We said there was a heart stage as well. So, and the cotyledons are here and here they're in torpedo stage. So by genetically enhancing certain types of life forms. We can take a closer look at the interior and see exactly what's going on at a given time. Another look at the events that occurred during the pollination event, which eventually led to fertilization, we can take a look at it in three different stages here. We have first the sperm cells that go down the pollen tube and eventually reach the egg and the polar nuclei, which gives us the triploid endosperm and the diploid zygote. Um, if we take a look at it after a little bit more development, we can see the embryo has started to grow in here. There's a seed coat on the outside, which is now has a fruit growing around it, which is coming from the ovary of the plant. The embryo is diploid, the endosperm is triploid, and eventually um, there will be a formation of a completed seed, and the fruit will harbor that seed. Here's another look down here where we have... Um, the eight cell part of the uh, female reproductive structure here, polar nuclei in the center, antipodal cells on the top, synergids and eggs. When those sperm reach this structure, what we're gonna get is a male and female combination, which is gonna form the embryo, the base of this structure. The endosperm is going to consist of two female haploid sets of chromosomes plus the sperm that came down and connected with them. And that's why this is triploid, this is diploid. And the integuments are going to be a set of, uh, come from the antipodal cells and become the seed coat. And they come from two haploid female seeds, uh, female cells as well. After double fertilization, each ovule will develop into a seed. The embryo and its food supply are enclosed by a hard protective seed coat. And then the seed will be ready to enter a state of dormancy. While it's in dormancy, the ovary, the female, the big green nodule that we saw in the previous, pic, uh, previous slide, it's going to develop into a fruit that's going to enclose that seed. Now, if we take a look at here, uh, we have a two different types of angiosperms. One, this is a eudicot right here. There we go. And here we have a monocot. So some of the same structures are found in each one of these. And sometimes there's a little bit of difference there. So with cotyledons, we know that in a dicot, there's two. That's where its name comes from. Whereas in a uh, monocot, we just have the one. Each one has a seed coat. Each one also has a radical, which eventually is going to be the thing that comes out of the seed when it's ready to germinate. Um, there's a hypocotyl and an epicotyl, and these are going to be part of the growing plant when it gets its start. And then the endosperm is going to be the nutrient supply for the cotyledons, and at least to begin the growth of this particular plant. Monocots, we said, have one cotyledon. Grasses and, uh, for example, like maize and wheat, they have a special cotyledon called the scutellum. And um, the scutellum, as we can see in this picture, is right here. We also have two she's that are going to have some protective function of the growing embryo. So the first one's called a coleoptile. And what that's going to do, it's going to kind of protect as this 
seed develops and it's going to grow shoots upwards and downwards, the coleoptile is going to protect it on its upward way through the soil. Meanwhile, the coleoriza is going to protect the root as this grows downward um, toward into the soil and it starts exploring the soil for good root um, adherence to the to the ground itself. Germination is going to depend on a scientific concept called imbibition, which is the uptake of water due to low water potential. Earlier in the year, we learned that water potential is going to allow water to flow from something that has high water potential or a high concentration of water molecules to one that has lower. So in the case of a seed, there's going to be more H2O outside in the soil than there is going to be in a seed. And we know that, you know, as early as elementary school and middle school, we took seeds and we put them on wet paper towel. And what happened? Well, the water left the paper towel and went into the seed and germinated the seed. And from that point, the first thing we probably saw was the radical. The radical explored out of the seed. And, in the, and usually that's done under the soil, but if you're doing it on a wet paper towel, you can actually see it happen. The hypocotyl was the next thing we see that is actually is going to grow upward when it's in soil, and that's going to do so to protect um, the rest of the plant growth as it emerges at this very fragile state. Meanwhile, the radical went downward and is now forming the initial structures of the roots. And the cotyledon is now going to be pulled upwards by the hypocotyl bend that we see very characteristic in, like, for example, a bean that is sprouting. The cotyledon will continue to wither away as nutrients are utilized for the growing plants. Here we start to see some foliage leaves that are starting to come out. And eventually the cotyledons will become these very brittle, dry structures. They won't be uh, needed any longer and they'll actually just break off. And meanwhile, we'll see the roots and the shoots uh, go on a growth spurt, mitotically dividing um, as long as there's... Uh, enough water present and nutrients present for survival. We mentioned seed dormancy and seed germination. And here is just kind of a sneak peek at as to what it looks like inside of a particular seed. The radical we see is coming out right now. Epicotyl is uh, just behind it there. And like we said earlier, it just takes a little bit of moist substrate in order to get germination to occur. But sometimes the requirements are a little bit more than just moisture. Sometimes a certain temp that's going to be required for germination. Other some kind, sometimes there'll be lighting changes. So depending on the species, there's a variety of environmental conditions that may aid seed germination. We mentioned earlier that monocots need a little bit of help at protecting the very vulnerable shoot roots and shoots that are growing out of the seed. So uh, we mentioned a couple words earlier, the coleoptile. That's a structure that's actually going to be protected by leaves as this monocot grows. So as this thing gets taller here, notice that there's kind of a cone shape here that's going to protect the apical meristem, which is the dividing cells of the tip of a shoot in this case. And we also have the radical, which you said was the thing that pops out of the out of the uh, seed upon germination. And that's growing and starting to explore the soil, looking for water, looking for nutrients, and trying to anchor properly this growing corn plant. So we've taken a look at a variety of things today. We look, took a look at plant basics. We took a look at the group of angiosperms, which is just one set of plants inside of the plant kingdom. I hope you understand plant reproduction a little bit better now. Keep reading that book, keep studying those notes, doing those reading guides, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.